our study this morning is in Luke chapter 13. We're going to look at the first five verses. Uh, this passage is found only here in Luke's gospel, nowhere else in the Bible. So a very unique uh, passage that we're about to read here, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. And it says this, There were present at that season some who told him, that's told Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so what we have here, are, uh, it's the mentioning of two specific events that were very tragic events. And um, when we study this together, you're going to notice Jesus does not really answer the question, why did these things happen? But what he's going to talk about is what we can learn from these tragic events. So I've entitled today's teaching, The Theology of Tragedy. At some point, we will all be touched by tragedy to some degree or another. So this is important for us to study this and understand this together. That's the topic of our study. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we just want to commit the study to you now and, and this passage that we're reading, and we pray that you would use it to minister to many hearts, Lord, those who are here, those who are watching online, those who will later listen to this or watch it on podcast. Because, Lord, we know that our hope is in you, and this world is filled with tragedy and difficulty and trials that we will go through. So we thank you, Lord, that you're our helper, you're our ever-present help in time of need, and so we pray that you would use this passage now to minister to our hearts, to as many as who really particularly need to hear it today. And, and Lord, for all of us, because at some point we're going to encounter difficulties of some kind. So use this passage to minister to us. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. According to a national survey conducted by George Barna on a scientifically selected cross-section of adults, the question that was asked was this, if you could ask God only one question and you knew he would give you an answer, what would you ask? The number one response was, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Now, it shouldn't really surprise us, should it, that the biggest spiritual issue that doesn't make sense to a majority of people is why is there pain and suffering in the world? It shouldn't surprise us because we're all touched by it to one degree or another. Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Christ, he, uh, sorry, The Case for Faith, he wrote this, quote, we read stories about the horrible evils like the Holocaust, the killing fields of Cambodia, and the genocide of Rwanda, and we can't help but wonder, where is God? We watch television coverage of earthquakes and hurricanes in which thousands perish, and we wonder, why didn't God stop it? We read the statistic that one billion people in the world lack the basic necessities of life, and we wonder, why doesn't God care? We may suffer ourselves with persistent pain or aching loss or seemingly hopeless circumstances, and we wonder, why doesn't God help? If He is loving and if He is all-powerful and if He is good, then surely all of this suffering should not exist, and yet it does." End quote. So the reality of tragedy and suffering and pain in our lives will cause some people to question God on two levels. For you note takers, or maybe you don't need to take notes because you would say, yep, this is my story. The first thing is some people question the very existence of God. When tragedy strikes and difficulty and pain and sorrow fill a person's life, sometimes that individual can ask a question, does God even exist? Suffering to some seems more compatible with a non-existent God than a loving God. And so their thinking goes something like this. Those who question the existence of God because of tragedy, their thinking goes like this, quote, you know, pain and suffering in this world and in our lives is evidence for the absence of God because a true God would not allow such suffering to exist. Therefore, God must not exist. That's kind of the reasoning for people who question the existence of God when there's tragedy in the world. 
And so with, with all sensitivity, and I mean that sincerely, I, I want to you know, be sensitive to people who are wrestling with the existence of God because of tragedy in the world and difficulty. And you look at the world and you go, I'm not even sure God exists. And, and I want to simply ask you to have an open mind to a few questions that I'm going to ask as you pursue an understanding of how do you reconcile whether God even exists in the midst of all this heartache. So here are some questions. What if evil exists apart from God? You have to consider that. What if evil exists apart from God? What if God does exist, but the perfect world that he intended for us was spoiled a long time ago when mankind rebelled against God? And what if because of man's rebellion against God, We've invited these things into our world like death and disease and abuse and murder and betrayal and every other form of evil and suffering because now it all affects us to some degree, even if we were not part of the original ones who rebelled against God. You know, Adam and Eve rebel against God. The Bible says sin enters the human race. The world becomes corrupted because of man's sinfulness against God. We, not, we may not have been part of the original offenders who rebelled against God, but we now suffer the consequences of living in a sin-stained world because of man's rebellion against God. So so it just is the natural consequence. You know, it's like secondhand smoke. You may not be smoking, but if you're in a room long enough with someone who does, it's going to rub off on you. Your clothes are going to smell. Your hair is going to smell. You might even have lung damage if you're around someone long enough who smokes. Secondhand smoke can affect you just because you're in the same room. And the reality is that tragedy affects us all to some degree or another just because we're on the same planet. And the same planet has been touched by man's sinfulness. So what if God does exist? But all that we see here is really the result of what man has done in rebellion to God, and we've invited all this to ourselves. But what if God does exist, and because he sees our suffering, God also knows that because of our suffering, we need a savior. So we put in motion a way to redeem us from sin and to rescue us from this world. What if? Now, if, if you don't struggle with the question of how can God exist in the middle of all the suffering and tragedy, then others might struggle with this question. Um, I'm not even sure God is good. They question the goodness of God. They would ask, why would a good loving God allow pain and suffering? And anyone who knows, you know, certain professions or certain responsibilities knows that sometimes what is painful is for our good. You know, a surgeon understands that, uh, an, an athletic trainer understands that, a physical therapist understands that, a parent understands that. Sometimes what you might be perceived as not being good, even though everything you're doing is beneficial in the long run, but still the perception is that you're not good. You know, when, when we took our kids and they were younger, our pediatrician was brilliant. Uh, he has, has since died, but our pediatrician, when our kids were little, if there was ever anything that, uh, uh, that inflicted pain of any kind, like giving a shot or was uncomfortable for the kids, like, you know, swabbing the back of their throat for a strep test or something, the doctor would always leave the room and get his nurse to do it. <laughs> it was smart. The nurse would come in, always do the difficult thing and the, the thing that would make the kids cry, and then the doctor would come back in with lollipops for the kids. It was brilliant. <laughs> So the kids always looked at the nurse, you know, the nurse is the bad one, the nurse, the nurse, the nurse, but love the doctor, because I'm going to get a lollipop at the end of all this, right? Well, so sometimes our perception is like we look at God like the nurse, like the nurse, the nurse, you know, you're always this, you're always that, and you're not good. No, 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 no. Sometimes the things that feel, you know, uh, uh, difficult and, um, and hard uh, are, are often for our good. And I quoted Johnny Erickson Tata a few weeks ago. She's uh, a quadriplegic, been in a wheelchair since a diving accident at the age of 17. She's been in a wheelchair for over 50 years now. And as a believer, she said this, quote, God sometimes permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. And that is true. It's hard for us, though. Our finite minds lack the ability to fully comprehend what God is up to and why God allows what he does. But our lack of understanding should not lead us to believe that God is not good. 
it should just remind us that we don't have a full understanding because we're, we're finite in our understanding. Now, the people of Jesus' day wrestled with the same things we do today. This whole conversation here in Luke chapter 13 has to do with two tragic events, and people are trying to make sense of it. You know, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And, and so when you look at these two tragic events, uh, one has to do with Pilate slaughtering people, and one has to do with a tower falling on people. One tragedy was intentional. Pilate intentionally murdered these Galileans on the Temple Mount area. And one tragedy was accidental when a tower fell on people. But both tragedies were painful because both involved human suffering and even death. And the truth is that there are tragic things that we will encounter in our lives too. Sometimes it'll be unfortunately intentional at the hands of evil people, and other times it'll just be accidental or it'll be just the natural byproduct of living in the world in which we live. Now, when we look here at this story in Luke 13, again, as I mentioned at the top of the study, we know nothing about these two incidents other than what is mentioned here in Luke 13. There is no other historical mention of these incidents. There's no other biblical reference to these incidents here outside of what Luke writes. So we don't have any of the details, which actually tells us something. God has allowed it to be included here in the pages of the Bible, not so that we can understand the details. You know, what exactly happened? What contributed to Pilate being so enraged that he would slaughter these people on the Temple Mount area? What were they doing? And why was he so angry? And what was the reason this tower fell? And was it a structural issue? Was it, you know, whatever. We don't have any of those details, which tells us the reason why God included it in the Scriptures is not so much that we can understand the details of why, but so that we can learn the lessons from these incidents incidences. Because Jesus doesn't touch on the details. Everybody seems to already know the details, but we're in the dark concerning the details. So, concerning the first event, Pontius Pilate slaughters some Galileans on the Temple Mount area. Now, this is the same Pontius Pilate who will, in a few years, have Jesus crucified. Pontius Pilate was made procurator or governor of Judea in the year A.D. 26 as part of the Roman Empire. His oversight was the region of the central territory of Israel, which included Jerusalem. But Pontius Pilate had a reputation for being a very cruel and bloodthirsty man. In fact, probably the events that we're reading about here in Luke 13 contributed to that ongoing reputation. He was very cruel and bloodthirsty, particularly against the Jews. So much so that he had already, history tells us, he had already been warned by Emperor Caesar that if he continues with his brutal, um, outrageous actions, he's going to be recalled by Rome and he's going to lose his command of Judea. This is the reason why, a little bit later, when he is put on the spot about having Jesus crucified, that at first, you know, he washes his hands of it. He's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this because he knows my job's already on the line. Caesar's going to recall me. And, and yet, because of the pressure of the people, he gives the order for Jesus to be crucified. You know, tragically, history records for us that Pontius Pilate, four years after Christ was crucified, he will be recalled, he will end up in Gaul, and four years after the crucifixion of Jesus, Pontius Pilate will commit suicide. So he was a very troubled man. And you see that trouble spilling over in this story here. He's just indiscriminately slaughtering some Galileans. And it tells us it has to be on the Temple Mount area because verse 1 in our story says that he mingled their blood with the sacrifices. So they're there in Jerusalem. They're offering sacrifices. Something goes awry and Pontius Pilate has them slaughtered there. Now, the second incident in our story is about a tower that fell in Siloam. And Jesus brings this one up. The first story the people brought up, Jesus adds to it. He goes, yeah, let me remind you about another story that was tragic. And he talks about this tower in Siloam that fell. Now, Siloam was a little region on the southeast corner outside of the walls of Jerusalem, of the old city. And it had a, um, a spring-fed pool there in Siloam. In fact, it's the location of one of Jesus' miracles in John chapter 9 when he heals a blind man and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Perhaps this tower was part of the aqueduct system there. We don't know. What we do know is Jesus specifically says 18 people died 
In the story, it tells us 18 people died when this tower fell on them. And it appears that people were already familiar with this story because he brings it up like everybody already knows it. But he attaches it to the first story of Pilate slaughtering the Galileans because both are related. Both are tragedies. And God wants us to understand how do we deal with tragedies in our lives. Three quick points. And here's the first theology of tragedy. Number one, tragedy is the natural consequence of a world polluted by sin. Now, I've already touched on this at the beginning of our study, but I just want to reiterate. You know, tragedy comes in different degrees and in different seasons of our lives. And there are some people who seem to be going through, you know, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And then there are some people who seem to be touched by very little. And sometimes it, it's, you know, cyclical. And so sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's a little. Sometimes it's a season and you come out of that season and you have some peace. And then there's some other things that happen. But every one of us, to one degree or another, will be touched by tragedy or heartache or hardship, again, because... That's the condition of the world in which we live. We live in a broken world. We are broken people. We have influenced our world because of our sin. Satan is influencing this world because of his evil. And the combination of both means we are living in a fallen world and we will be subject to the elements of a fallen world like the things I've already mentioned. Death, disease, heartache, you know, uh, man's inhumane treatment of man, just all these things that happen is a result of living in a fallen world. And again, you know, it shouldn't surprise us. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, in this world, you will have trouble. He just tells us like, this is part of the condition of this world. We have to accept it to some degree. It's just as reality. He does add, however, take heart, I've overcome the world. There is hope and there's a promise and there's an eternal future for us. But in the meantime, we have to deal with what reality is. New Living Translation says in John 16, 33, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And as in our story here in Luke 13, some of those things that we experience may be the evil intent of people, and it may just be accidental. It might just be the natural byproduct. We're living in a world, it has all of this you know, uh, corruption attached to it. And so sometimes we, we just are a part of it, even though we may not have contributed directly to it. It's just part of living in a fallen world. The good news is that rather than leave us to ourselves with no hope or a future, that God sent his son to redeem us from sin and to rescue us from this world so that one day we can leave this place and go to heaven where there is no more death or crying or pain because the old order has been replaced with a new order of things. So that is what is to come. Yes, and amen to that. And, and, this, and this is exactly why Paul would write in Romans 8, 18, for I consider my present sufferings not worthy to be compared to the future glory that awaits me in Christ Jesus. Like he had this perspective, he understood this world is gonna be hard. There's gonna be things that are terrible. And yet I don't live for this world. I'm only passing through. So I wanna represent Christ well, but I'm on my way to be with him forever and ever. And that's where our, our hope really lies, is in our eternal reward. Our hope is not here. If, if this is as good as it gets, you're in trouble, right? That's a sad story. If, if somebody's story is this is as good as it gets, that's bad for you, right? This is as bad as it gets for us who know Christ. This is as bad as it gets. Because when we're with him, then for all eternity, it'll be wonderful forever and ever. You know, the book of Job in the Bible is the most famous book uh, in the Bible on the topic of tragedy and suffering. And between Job chapters 38 and 41, God asks Job, seven, when God speaks through chapters 38 to 41 of the book of Job, he asks Job 77 rhetorical questions. 
77 rhetorical questions about cosmology and oceanography and meteorology and, uh, and just astronomy creation in general because God is the creator and so God is asking Job one question after another to help Job understand that God fashioned the earth, God limits the ocean, God brings light in the morning and darkness at night, God controls the weather, God spreads out the morning dew, God brings forth constellations, God waters the earth, God feeds the lion as well as the raven. And in all that God said to Job, he never addressed the subject of suffering directly. He never answered the question for Job, why am I suffering? God never answered that. What God ended up saying in summary of chapters 38 to 41 is something important that some of you need to hear. What God ended up basically saying to Job is this, Job, if I'm sovereign over the cosmos, and if I hold the world together by my sovereign power, don't you think that I can hold your life together during this season of your suffering? That's what he says to him. He says, I'm God, and I'm going I'm to hold your life together. I'm going to hold your world together. I'm kind of holding the whole cosmos together. So I can hold your world together when you are going through a season of suffering too. And that's important for us to hear. Consider, if you will, an egg and a potato when plunged into the same pot of boiling water. One becomes hardened and one becomes softened. And I bring this up because the issue of tragedy is not will it happen, but how will we respond to it? And what is interesting is, and I know for you scientists, you could explain the chemical reactions to this, but just the principle, the idea is, when exposed to the same heat, the same conditions, the egg becomes hardened, the potato becomes softened. And it is so true for all of us because when faced with similar trials or tragedies, some people become hardened towards God and some people become tender towards Him. It really has to do with how you choose to respond. Charles Spurgeon said it a little bit differently. Instead of the egg and the potato in boiling water, he said it this way, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. So the same intensity has two different reactions. And you can choose to either react towards God when he doesn't make sense and we don't understand with a hardened heart or you can become tender towards him. I have seen over the 30 plus years that I've been in ministry, when tragedy hits families, some families explode and some families draw closer. Some marriages break apart, some marriages get closer. Some people run from God and get angry with God and some people draw near to Him and they're tender hearted. It's very, very interesting. But the truth is that since tragedy is a natural consequence of our world, the issue is, how will we respond to it? Oh, I pray that we would still be tenderhearted towards the things of the Lord. Here's number two. I've got to breeze through this. I'm running out of time. Number two, tragedy does not mean that someone is a worse sinner. I need to point this out because Jesus does twice in this story. After each of these two tragic events that Jesus refers to, he says this. Look in your Bibles again, verse 2. He says, do you suppose that these Galileans, the ones who were slaughtered by Pilate, were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. And then in verse 4, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. And Jesus makes this clear, and it is something that we need to hear he makes it clear that these tragic events had no correlation to an individual's sinfulness. Now, it is true that we are all sinners. And it is also true that sometimes our sinful choices can lead to hardship in our own lives. Sometimes we invite it. That's the result of sinful choices. Proverbs 13, 15 says, the way of the transgressor is hard. And Galatians 6, 7 says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So there, there is that connection. 
But when it comes to tragedies, tragedies happen to people because we live in a fallen world, not because God is punishing them because somehow they are, quote, worse sinners. Jesus is setting us straight right here. We need to look at tragic events and not start to get judgmental in our hearts and think, well, they must have been worse sinners, and God was giving them some judgment there. No, and in the same way, if we escape the tragedy, we can't think of ourselves as being more righteous than others. Both are wrong. When tragedy strikes people, we cannot stand back and go, God was giving them a, a dose of the great day of judgment by giving them a little bit of judgment early. They're not worse sinners. And we're not more righteous if we happen to escape tragedy or have a little bit less of it. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45, that God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You know, when I think about the Tower of Siloam falling here, it, it conjures to my mind the Twin Towers falling on 9-11. People died. And it doesn't mean that the people who died in the Twin Towers on 9-11 were worse sinners than people who escaped and likewise, people who escaped on that day are not more righteous than the people who died. Let's bring it home even with this current thing with COVID. You know, some people get COVID and one person tragically dies, another person recovers and hardly has any symptoms at all. It doesn't mean that the one who died is God's punishment. They're a worse sinner. And the one who lived, they're more righteous. Don't look at stuff that way. Tragedy and death happens. But it is not a pronouncement by God of who is good and who is evil. Because why? Because we're all evil. We're all sinners. You know, like I've said this before, but when you look at the Bible, the Bible is not about good guys and bad guys and trying to figure out if you're a good guy or a bad guy. The Bible is about all bad guys, that's all of us, and one good guy, that's Jesus, who died for all the bad guys. That's what the Bible's about. So we must not get judgmental in our hearts and think, well, they must have been worse sinners, Jesus says twice after each event. They were not worse sinners. The last point. After each tragic event related to Pilate killing the people and the Tower of Siloam falling on people, Jesus says, notice in your Bibles, verse 3, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He repeats it in verse 5, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So here's the last point. Tragedy is not all related to God's judgment. However, God's judgment is the ultimate tragedy. We should worry less about whether some tragic event befell our neighbor, whether or not was that God's punishment, and be more concerned about whether we ourselves are ready to face God's ultimate judgment. Was it a tragic thing that Pilate slaughtered people in the temple complex? Yes. Was it a tragic thing that a tower fell and crushed 18 people? Yes, of course. But it would be even more tragic to wonder why that happened and where was God and how could he allow that instead of wondering, am I ready to face God when I die? As sad as it is, Jesus is basically saying to his hearers here, and I think he's saying the same thing to us, you know, you can't help what happened to them, but you can help what happens to you. Because there could be a tragic story written about your life if you don't repent and get right with God. You know, whenever I do a funeral, and, uh, you know, sometimes the casket is down at the front and sometimes it's not. But everybody who comes to a funeral is there to remember the one who died, to celebrate the person because they were a friend or family member. And the focus is on the person who died. But every time I... I, I give a, a eulogy at a funeral, I'm always careful because I think it's, it's prudent of after we celebrate the individual of turning the question on everybody who's here, which is, okay, this person, you can't, you can't affect whatever happened to this person, but you have a choice about how that happens to you. And are you ready to meet your maker? Are you right with God? And that's the question that every single one of us needs to face. And that's the big question of this whole text here. He's like, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Don't worry about the details of why it happened and where it was God and all this kind of stuff. You better ask the question, are you ready to meet your maker? Because every single one of us is going to face God. And the good news is, this is why Jesus says, repent. If you don't repent, you'll likewise perish. But if we repent, if we turn from our sins and turn toward God, 
receive Jesus as our Savior, put our faith and trust in Him, then guess what? The grave cannot hold us. And when you die a physical death, your spirit goes to be with the Lord and you will be forever with Him. You will be exiting this world and you will be entering paradise forever and ever to be with Jesus in heaven. That will be a glorious day. In the meantime, turn to Him now. He will help you to manage your tragedies here. But one day you'll be with Him where there will be no more tragedies. I'm looking forward to that day. Are you? Amen. Are you? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this, this passage that reminds us about tragedy and difficulty that happened to people. And at the end of the day, Lord, the big question is, are we ready to meet you? And I, before, Lord, I, I deal with that, I just want to pray your, your help for those who are going through something really difficult right now. They're hearing this Bible study and they're thinking, yeah, I've got my share of tragedy and difficulty I'm dealing with right now. Lord, would you please show yourself strong to them? Would you please encourage them? Send somebody along their path who will come even today and just give them a word of encouragement or want to pray with them. You know who they are right now. You know those who are heavy hearted when they came in here. You know those who have been wrestling and struggling with bad news or something discouraging or grief or whatever the case might be. God, minister to them right now, I pray. Encourage their hearts. But how tragic would it be if all we do is have a Bible study about tragic things but not think about our own mortality? And so, Lord, I pray for men, women, and young people right now who need to get right with you. They've been running from you. Maybe they've been angry at you. I pray today that their hearts would be softened towards you. That they would trust you as Lord and Savior. So I'm going to pause in my prayer right now with your head still bowed. And I'm just going to invite you to give your life to Jesus today. To turn your heart to him. Don't become hardened by life. Life is hard by itself. But allow the hardness of life to turn your heart tender towards God. And cry out to Him today. If you don't know Him in, in a personal way as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to trust Him today. I'm going to lead in a word of prayer and I'm going to go slowly enough so that you can pray it with me. And just make it your prayer today. Just invite Christ into your heart. Just trust Him as your Savior. Come on, pray, pray it with me. You can just whisper this prayer with me right where you're seated. Just, just say, Lord Jesus, I thank You that You love me, that You died on a cross for me. And I know I'm a sinner like everyone else. And I live in a sinful, fallen world. But I need You today. I need You to forgive me of my sins. I need you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you. I want to be tender hearted towards you, Lord. That you loved me and you died on a cross for me. So I come to you. I come to you by faith. And I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Save me today. Save me today. By faith, I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, before you're dismissed, if you prayed that prayer, there's going to be a pastor down front here to give you a Bible just to remember today's decision. We don't want anything from you, just a Bible. And if you prayed that prayer online, there's a number on the screen, 703-844-9969. And if you text the church, we'll send you a Bible if you prayed that prayer. Good day. Amen. Church. Amen. Good day. God bless you all.